welcome to Indianomics. The Indian government has been lately talking and doing a lot to make the Indian rupee an international currency. One reason is the growing realization that India will soon be the third largest economy, probably by the end of this decade. The rupee deserves to be an international currency simply because of this. The bigger reason, however, is a push factor. The sanctions against Russian entities and the impounding of Russian dollar reserves has rattled emerging markets like India who hold dollar reserves and realize that the West can always weaponize the dollar. Thirdly, there is a technology factor. Technology has arrived, so to speak. More central banks uh, uh, may have uh, central bank digital currencies or CBDCs that can be used for bilateral payments without an intervening dollar or euro. Also, it is now possible to connect India's UPI to the payment systems of other countries for small cross-border retail payments. The government and the Reserve Bank have therefore taken some steps to facilitate the rupee's growing role. Reserve Bank has put out a report recommending steps that the country can take to facilitate rupee payment for exports and imports. And the government of India has been signing agreements uh, lately with the UAE and earlier with Malaysia to facilitate local currency usage for trade, invoicing imports and exports in local currencies. Today we are asking what are the advantages of an international role for the rupee? What are the disadvantages, if any? How can we make in the rupee an international currency in the sense of the near term and the medium term steps? For all these questions, I have with me an elite panel, Professor Arvind Panagaryal, Professor of Economics uh, at Columbia University, Mr. G. Padmanabhan, former executive director at the Reserve Bank and responsible for a lot of the payment systems, Heman Mishra, co-founder of Scoop Capital and in his previous avatar, uh, a very key player in the Indian Forex market. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Uh, well, let me start with you, Mr. Padmanabhan, because you have been there, done that. Uh, so, you know, for starters, do you think we are in a better position now or is this still a very distant ambition uh, to, you know, invoice uh, uh, payments, exports or imports in uh, the Indian rupee? Uh, <clears throat> good evening, Lata. Happy to be back with your show. Uh, let me start this way. I think invoicing in Indian rupee was something which is which was always there. I think for several years, invoicing in rupee was always permitted. Uh, to what extent it was happening is a different question because uh, one reason one could uh, easily point out is that nobody who wants who is a receiver would want to invoice in a currency which historically has been showing a secular decline. So although the invoicing in rupee through the Vostrokan route was always permissible, even under the Ferrar days, I think the number of transactions that were happening using the rupee was few and far between. Okay. Now, we juxtapose this with the ambition of what we call the internationalization. Now, the internationalization, if it is understood in a classic manner, I think... Uh, this an international currency means that this is being used beyond the borders by people who are not doing transactions with the respective countries and who are doing transactions among themselves. So basically, we are talking about a currency just like the US dollar, which gets used between in transactions where US may not be even involved. If you if you start looking at these moves from that aspect, then probably I think we are thinking far ahead of the way in which the government and the Reserve Bank is thinking. Okay, I, I, Now, I, I, what yeah. led to all this kind of things, if I can take a minute and explain that, I think the recent geopolitical uh, situation that developed following the Russian-Ukraine uh, war actually drove home two truths. Mm -hmm. One is that I think that I have an international asset, but I suddenly find that I'm not able to utilize that asset because it gets frozen which is exactly what happened to the reserves of the Russian Central Bank. The second issue is that I think a private organization is a pure private organization that cannot be influenced because of geopolitical factors. That also was proved wrong because once the American sanctions came, 
the SWIFT was not available for transactions with Russia. Now, these are the developments which the emerging markets and the other countries have been closely looking at. Yeah. So today, the steps that have been taken by the Reserve Bank of India gradually, and even if you look at, look at the report that they are talking mm -hmm. about, it, mm -hmm. what we are talking about is a process, not an event. Ah. So in that process, we have now facilitated the rupee invoicing. Got it. We have facilitated special wash to accounts. We are prepared to open bilateral swap lines, which China has been doing for the last so many years. Okay. So these are all the process which have been started. And after all, mm -hmm. if we have an ambition about rupee being an international currency, please remember that people should start using the currency for trade transactions. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's exactly according to me what Reserve Bank of India and the government has facilitated. Got it. Uh, so actually, you put the uh, first distinction on the table very well by saying that an international role of the rupee and invoicing exports and imports in rupee are two different things. Uh, international is a longer term goal and immediately invoicing some of our imports and exports in rupee rather than in dollar could be the first step which uh, the central bank and the government seem to be enabling. I mean, that's very good to know that this is the sequence. Uh, but uh, before that, some uh, you know broader issues and uh, uh, Professor Paragaria, thank you very much for joining. And let me turn to you for that. The, uh, you know, India is also becoming, we are building tariffs. And I think you pointed that out in one of our previous conversations. We have also uh, started building a little bit of tariff warriors, which, uh, tariff walls, which means less globalization. There are other indications that India is not prepared to go the whole hog because we try to restrict the amount we depend on global debt. Uh, even, uh, you know, we, we don't want a sovereign dollar debt. So do you think even mentally, we are not quite prepared to go the whole hog as an international currency? <laughs> well, you know, going international currency, of course, is a, a, a very distant event. Yeah. Um, before that happens, you know, we have to grow much larger. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you mentioned quite correctly, on international trade front, uh, we have to open much wider. And uh, now, you know, uh, it, uh, as it is, uh, our share in the global trade is about in merchandise trade is less than two percent. In services, somewhere closer to four percent. But these are still very small shares. Now, for comparison, here uh, look at China, which has about thirteen to fourteen percent share in merchandise exports. Uh, services is also larger than us for sure. Uh, and uh, if you look at, you know, who is holding uh, yuan, the Chinese currency, uh, as a part of its reserves, uh, it's tiny. You know, there's only about 2% of the reserves currently are held by uh, in, in yuan. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, 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 this goal is distant. I think it is work in progress. What we are doing is the right thing to do. Uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 because they're a part of our own e evolution into a more global, larger player uh, uh, on the global stage. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, a lot of this thing, you know, a lot of internationalization of the rupee will happen as we grow bigger, as we open up the economy. Uh, also, there are issues of capital account convertibility and so forth. So uh, these are processes that will go hand in hand. Uh, and as our uh, weight in the uh, uh, global economy rises, uh, inevitably good things will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, as an example, for uh, you know, the, the Chinese yuan was included in the SDR basket. Yes. Uh, and that is something you know we can aspire to in in somewhere near, in the near future. But trade-wise, we have to grow much bigger for that to happen. Okay. Uh, well, uh, uh, Professor Paragari, I'm going to come back to you to even speak about the disadvantages because if the currency is used everywhere, uh, it will also mean perhaps uh, less control over our own monetary policy. But I'll come to that in a minute. Let me get first thoughts from Hemant Mishra as well, who has also in a way been there, done that. Uh, Hemant, uh, do you see reluctance on the part of uh, counterparties, say importers, uh, uh, from India or uh, even exporters into India hesitating to take the rupee because we are almost a deficit with most countries. What will they do if we pay them for their imports in rupees? Uh, uh, do they have enough use for it? So will there be a natural resistance? Uh, good evening, Lata. So it's always a pleasure to be on your show. Uh, so to your, to your query, I think the timing could not have been better. 
And in some ways, it builds on what uh, Dr. Panagriya and uh, Mr. Padmanabhan have said. So we, we don't have to uh, go all hawk. Mm. I think that the, the, the times have changed. I think nobody talks about, uh, you know, you making extreme measures or becoming capital account convertible for you to have a globalized currency. I think, you know, as, as the IDG report by the Reserve Bank of India very uh, neatly articulates, uh, internationalizing the currency is, is a process and not an event. It's an evolutionary step. It's a process that the RBI... Uh, uh, kind of uh, started some time ago in a very measured and calibrated manner, uh, focusing on the trade account. Uh, and, and I would actually say, you know, uh, I mean, they did uh, the masala bond, which was pretty much a capital account relaxation, but will progressively move towards the capital account as well. But I see this as uh, a process in uh, serving the uh, larger economic development of the country and not being uh, uh, a means in itself. Now, importers and exporters in the past uh, uh, have reacted with caution uh, for the reason that particularly people who will be long uh, INR asset, uh, you know, for an exporter who's uh, an overseas exporter who's uh, selling goods into India, if he's going to receive his receivable and rupee asset, which uh, as Mr. Padmanabhan rightly mentioned, was always seen as uh, a secularly uh, declining asset. And as you would know, uh, no exporter, no capital provider wants to be sitting long, uh, a diminishing asset. So there, there has been that resistance. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are there are three mega trends that are happening at this point in time, and which is why I think the timing is very important. The first is uh, the move to uh, multipolarity. Uh, you know, you, everybody recognizes that moving, moving, moving away from a unipolar to a multipolar world, uh, and which is why people want alternatives. Uh, and the INR... Uh, I mean, let's be real. It's not going to become uh, a very credible alternative in the near future. Uh, but, but as I mentioned, it's a long-term uh, process. Uh, the second is uh, what was China plus one becoming an alternative to China? I mean, I increasingly see this. I was on I was on a road show in New York City, then I attended an event in Singapore. Normally, when I would talk to investors, uh, you know, while while our team is largely Indian, you would always get more queries on China and Southeast Asia. Oh. Uh, I've seen a tangible shift. Uh, people wanting uh, to know more about India. And the conversation is not about why India. It's about how India. Uh, how do we invest into India? How do we manage the risk? And this, in some ways, is going to be uh, uh, an integral part of that particular solution. But the third bit is very important. Uh, for a long time, uh, you know, the, the Indian macro has not been as robust as it has been now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we, we've had an international currency pre, uh, uh, pre uh, independence for a short period of time. We had it in the uh, UAE uh, post independence as well. We've had the rupee uh, traded uh, among some of our SAR countries. Uh, so I would think, uh, you know, this is potentially the best time, uh, but, but we've got to be real. Uh, things are not going to change all of a sudden. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a measured uh, uh, and a calibrated approach, even amongst the uh, investing community and the invoicing community. Okay. Well, absolutely. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, music to a, uh, an Indian's ears that there are more conversations and questions about India. Uh, in fact, uh, we were speaking with the IFMR, the uh, guys who track global funds, and uh, they are noticing a lot of uh, India-dedicated funds coming in. Otherwise, we were only receiving GEM funds or generally the uh, emerging market funds. Now, specific India-dedicated flows are increasing exponentially. Uh, but Mr. Panagaria, you know, before I come to the how, uh, which uh, both uh, you and Mr. Padmanabhan and uh, actually even Hemant has have already touched a bit, I wanted to ask you whether, uh, you know, are we putting the horse before the cart? Should we even aim for too much of an international role? As Hemant says, we are still seen as a de secularly depreciating currency. And we would like to be, you know, in the last few weeks, uh, last 10 weeks, both the dollar and the yuan have been falling and the RBI is working extra hard to continue to sell dollars to ensure that the rupee does not appreciate. So, considering that we actually want to uh, support the Indian economy, both uh, protect from imports and encourage exports by keeping the rupee depreciated, you think this is a secondary goal, making the rupee uh, international currency? The first is using the currency to bolster ourselves. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, uh, internationalization is a sort of byproduct. That's how I see it. Uh, only thing, you know, which has made it urgent is, as Mr. Padmanabhan said, uh, the, the freezing of the Russian assets uh, 
dollar assets and the, the uh, denial of access to the SWIFT system. That is what has really triggered this. But otherwise, you know, uh, uh, evidently we have to run our macro properly. We have to run our exchange rate correctly. Um, uh, these goals really uh, take precedence over uh, almost any other uh, 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 as far as the currency issues are concerned. Uh, so uh, internationalization certainly is not going to drive our policies. It is our policies which will drive our internationalize internationalization. And there are a few things that we can proactively do without r risking anything on the macro side uh, otherwise. I mean, things like, you know, the kind of arrangements that uh, India is trying to forge with Malaysia or with uh, Nepal or, uh, uh, you know, some of the... Uh, uh, payments that uh, uh, were uh, done uh, with Russian trade uh, on oil in rupees, uh, these, you know, bilateral rupee, uh, uh, even if you could multilateralize that, you know, their payments union kind of arrangements that have existed in Europe before, uh, soon after the Second World War and all. So those sorts of arrangements can be done, but that really doesn't impact any of our other uh, uh, macro uh, uh, policies. Uh, uh, and and that is the right way to proceed. You know, we personally, you know, meaning we for India, uh, we are not under any sort of uh, risk of uh, our dollar assets being frozen or that's our right. uh, uh, access to SWIFT being denied. I mean, that's an extremely extremely low pro prob probability event, uh, simply because you know our relations are actually yeah. not only very good with uh, both both europe and the united states but they are on a very rapidly kind of uh, climbing uh, <laughs> yes. uh, uh, rapidly rising uh, uh, trajectory yeah. uh, and and so you know that risk is simply not there uh, uh, that also shouldn't really drive us in in, in any serious way uh, but uh, as long as you know some of these arrangements can be made uh, uh, to to do some clearing of the rupee payments, okay. uh, that also is on a limited scale. You can't do on a large scale. Fair One thing we can do, of course, is you know uh, agree to accept all payments uh, 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 for our exports or anything we sell abroad mm. in rupees. You know anybody who Absolutely. wants to make those payments in rupees, yes. we shouldn't have no objections to do, to do that. Okay, uh, that might give a little bit of Philip uh, uh, to to, okay. to the use of rupee no, as well yeah but no, chances uh, are done, chances think, are know, it, it, sir actually chances are the uh, the rbi was at least uh, until a few months back wanting to actually accumulate the reserves that it lost in 2022 so you know rbi was equally keen that we accepted dollars as you say uh, it is not the first goal now to make a, a rupee a global country the first goal is really growth and macros and uh, internationalization will happen in its own good time but I do want the steps that we have to take in the short and the medium term to also allow the rupee to become a global currency. Those questions after the break, we are back in a jiffy.